Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the 2021 Institute for Humanities Research Distinguished Lecture with Adrian Marie Brown. I'm the Institute's Director, Nicole Anderson, and it's a pleasure to have this event be my opportunity to say hello for the first time to the Arizona State University Humanities Community. The IHR Annual Distinguished Lecture Program brings to campus a figure that is prominent in the study of the humanities. At ASU and especially at IHR, one of our missions is to highlight the importance of the humanities and the study of human experience in order to contribute to a better future for all. That work necessitates that we take cues from humanities disciplines such as literature, from poetry to science fiction, from the natural world and from the history of community organisation to shape that future together. This is the 15th anniversary of the Distinguished Lecture Program, and we're so pleased to have you all join us today to celebrate the work of writer, pleasure activist, science fiction and Octavia Butler scholar, facilitator, singer and doula, Adrian Marie Brown. Before we get started, I'd like to extend my gratitude to those who've made this event possible. First, thank you to our IHR staff team members that are behind the scenes today. Lauren Whitby, Senior IHR Communications Specialist, Liz Grumbach, Assistant Director of the IHR, and Selena Azuna, IHR Coordinator. Thank you also to Ron Brolio, Associate Director, and to Joseph Carter of Livestream Success, who is running our live stream today. Most importantly, I would like to thank our co-sponsors, the Centre for Science and the Imagination, the Centre for Race and Democracy, and the Faculty Women of Colour Caucus for their coordination and support in making this event possible. Before I introduce our moderator, I just have a few housekeeping items to address. The Zoom chat has been disabled for this event. To pose a question for our speaker today, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the live stream on YouTube. Our IHR team will relay those questions to our moderator to be addressed during the Q&A portion of the event. Please feel free to pose a question at any time during the event. Now, with no further ado, it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce Dr. Mako Fitzward, who will be our moderator for this event. Dr. Mako Fitzward is an educator, writer, facilitator, and social justice advocate with over 15 years of experience teaching core principles of justice and social change to college students and advocating for racial and gender equity in communities around the country. She is an assistant professor of African-American and women and gender studies in the School of Social Transformation at ASU. Her work explores intersectional feminist analysis of popular culture, specifically urban youth cultures and their impact on contemporary social movements. She is the co-editor of Pandemic Pedagogy, Social Injustice in the Time of COVID-19, which is forthcoming in the spring of 2021 from DIO Press. Also, she is currently serving as a research fellow with the Attaway Group, a consulting firm that provides services in the areas of race equity, inclusion, social justice, strategic planning and organisational change. Her work has been published in a wide range of journals, edited volumes and popular news blogs. Dr. Ward, I will turn the time over to you and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I want to begin by acknowledging my dear colleague, Dr. Lois Brown, who's the director of the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy here at ASU. And Dr. Brown was meant to serve as the moderator for this evening's program. Unfortunately, she is unable to be with us and we are sending her lots of love and well wishes from our beloved community here at ASU. If you are posting live or will share across social media platforms, please use the hashtag IHRDL2021, DL capitalized. So I am thrilled and honored and deeply humbled to introduce our distinguished lecturer. And for all of us watching on Zoom or live streaming on YouTube to experience the magic, embodied pleasure and pure joy that is Adrienne Marie Brown. 
She is the writer in residence at the Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute and author of We Will Not Cancel Us and Other Dreams of Transformative Justice, Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good, Emergent Strategy, Shaping Change, Changing Worlds, and the co-editor of Octavia's Brew, Science Fiction from Social Justice Movements and How to Get Stupid White Men Out of Office. She is the co-host of the How to Survive the End of the World and Octavia's Parables podcast. Please join me in welcoming Adrienne Marie Brown. Hello, everyone. Um, it's me, Adrienne. I was telling the host for this that I'm going to do my best to be very distinguished um, tonight and earn the honorific. And I'm really grateful to all the different bodies at ASU that came together to have me, to make it possible for me to spend what has been an incredible day with y'all. Um, and I'm gonna start, I, I actually wrote my thoughts tonight because that seemed more distinguished. And um, I'm gonna start by speaking to um, the core ideas that make up the skeletal structure of my work each of which is tied to writing that I've done um, or writing that I've gathered. And then I wanna share with you all some things that I've been just thinking about lately. And I was really grateful for the invitation to this because it was really like, we wanna hear what you're thinking in present time. And I don't often get that invitation. A lot of times people are like, we wanna hear you talk about this, this and that. And it's, it's, it's things that I was thinking about, you know, five years ago, three years ago, two years ago. And those things are still very much alive and exciting to me. And um, they keep changing and growing and developing. And so I really get thrilled when I get asked to bring fresh thoughts. So these are fresh thoughts. These are like in the last 24 hours, some of the things that I've been like, oh, huh, here's a thought. <laughs> so um, I hope that they resonate with you all. And um, I really like the process of sharing and learning and growing thoughts in public. So um, yeah, I'm excited to see how this goes. But first, the kind of core thoughts. So um, radical imagination, uh, visionary fiction um, is one of the first core ideas. And um, the book that it's tied to is Octavia's Brood, which I co-edited with Walida E. Marisha, who um, named visionary fiction as fiction that actually uplifts bottom up grassroots community change that is neither utopian nor dystopian, but understands that they often have to coexist um, and that we want something that's beyond and more dynamic and, and complex than all of that. Um, it's fiction that really focuses on the stories of those who have been pushed to the margins and the sidekick roles. Um, it's stories that really think about like how does change actually happen in these incremental ways. Um, so visionary fiction, right? What is it we're trying to bring into the world? And we have to understand that imagination shapes the world. And so those of us who have been oppressed by how others imagine the world, the supremacists, the patriarchs, the warmongers, the capitalists, um, we have to imagine something so compelling that it moves us beyond and out of the compliance with our own entrapment in these systems that do not love us. Terry Marshall called this uh, the imagination battle that we're in. And people, I mean, I spoke about this earlier today, but people really literally use their imagination, you know, in court, <laughs> they'll be in court and they'll say, I, I imagine that this unarmed young black child was a threat to me. Um, and my imagination of being in, in fear of this person is why I killed them. And that holds up in court that, that judges will dismiss the charges or will let someone off because they imagined something. So if imagination is that powerful, then I am really interested in how do we harness imagination and how do we break out of the habit of individual competitive imagination and begin to practice collaborative ideation, collective imagination. Um, I think the more of us that imagine the future, the more of us who will find ourselves and our bodies and our needs met in that time and space. And the lineage of that thinking is Octavia E. Butler, who wrote 12 novels and a collection of short stories, um, and I think was a prophet and a genius. So each of the ideas that I work with has at least one, if not multiple lineages, which I think is important to name and to be in a practice of citing and naming. Um, so the second core idea is 
emergent strategy. And emergent strategy, um, I'm kind of geeked out because this is our birthday week. So the book dropped on March 24th in 2017. And um, it has gone so far beyond what I imagined <laughs> uh, was possible for it. And it, it really, you know, there was no pushing that book. There was no promoting that book. Um, it really spread by word of mouth. It was, it was kind of its own emergent experiment. And it, it has, um, what it, I think it has done, it has met what was happening in communities uh, where people were like, we are doing this. We are getting in relationship with change. So some of the core questions, some of the core pieces of it is how do we be with each other and how do we hold change? How do we be in right relationship with change if we recognize that it's always happening? You know, Octavia Butler wrote, all that you touch, you change. And all that you change changes you. And the only lasting truth is change. And she said, God is change. And, but for many of us, we were raised in a lineage where we could be victims of God, that God could punish us, that God was controlling it. In Octavia's you know, perspective in the parable of the sower and the parable of the talents, particularly, um, you know, she said, we're not victims of change. We can actually learn to shape change. And if we are learning that, if we can harness that together, um, then we can start to accept, oh, change is constant. And we are part of what happens to create the adaptations that lead where we want them to lead. And this comes from our fractal nature, which is the nature of the relationship between the small and the large, that everything large that we are or that we want or that we see is made up of all these small parts and small patterns. And how do we set small patterns that can grow into massive patterns of change? But it's also in our practices. What is it that we are currently practicing that is aligned or is not aligned with the future that we want? And how do we begin practicing, iterating, repeating, new things that will actually put us in that alignment. Um, we see this in our resilience, right? Our capacity to recover when harm has happened, that none of our peoples have stopped. We continue, we keep going. Um, and I think emergent strategy is also super present in how we build relationships with each other. So in, in what has emerged from the book coming out is something called the Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute, where we've been um, playing with how do we facilitate and mediate community to deepen with each other, to, to be in relationships with each other that can withstand change and that can withstand difference, right? That we can actually not all try to be exactly the same thing, but the oak tree can be the oak tree and the mushroom can be the mushroom and the sparrow can be the sparrow and everything can actually play its position inside of the fecund biodiversity that creates a healthy ecosystem. We wanna be a healthy ecosystem. So this year, Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute has launched a podcast. So I guess technically I've got three podcasts now um, with Mia and Sage, the other collective members. Uh, every week we are interviewing, or every episode, we are interviewing someone who we see as an emergent strategist in the world. And that also feels important to show just how many people are out there practicing this in different ways. Because we don't want this to be bottlenecked. I'm like, I didn't create this. I didn't... Um, you know, just imagine it. It's like, I observed this because it's happening all around us. And the lineage of uh, emergent strategy is also with Octavia Butler, um, as all good things are, <laughs> but also Grace Lee Boggs, who was a Asian American activist here in Detroit, who blew my mind and changed my mind and, and made me step up into being like, what does it mean to be a responsible member of community? And Margaret Wheatley, who wrote Leadership in the New Sciences and really helped me learn and think about complex sciences and what they have to do with how we show up in community. And with Charity Hicks, who was a Detroit-based activist, um, water warrior, and who was killed um, a few years ago. And all of them together with a bunch of people here in Detroit helped me learn emergent strategy. And I think we will continue learning it. We also just launched a mediation resource because so many people in movement are in conflict right now and needing support. So it's just a beginning of a resource. It's really crowdsourced, but um, that's emergent strategy. <sighs> These are big ideas. I'm like, how to fit them all in. So the third kind of big idea space is pleasure activism. 
And pleasure activism um, is one of my favorite things to talk about because when I say the words to people, it's almost like in the reaction people have, I can see what level of repression <laughs> we're dealing with. So uh, for some people, they're like, so total hedonistic sex dungeon. And I'm like, uh, you know, if I always say this, no judgment, if that is what you need in order to feel contentment and joy in life, start to dig that dungeon out of the earth. But for most of us, we actually have um, a much wider range of needs. So sex is part of that. Maybe drugs are part of that. There's other things that can be part of pleasure, but there's so much about uh, being able to be in relationship, being able to know ourselves. And so some of the core questions of pleasure activism are how do we remember ourselves from the inside out? How do we reclaim all of us? How do we reclaim our right to happiness, contentment and satisfaction from the myths and delusions of oppression, of supremacy? How do we make justice and liberation the most pleasurable experiences that humans can have together? How do we become collectively satisfiable? And this is a question I learned in generative somatics. Uh, I remember one of my teachers turned in and was like, are you satisfiable? <laughs> and um, I don't think anyone had ever asked me that. I don't think I'd really considered that. And the more I considered it, the more I understood this is part of how we stay out of our power is we have no idea what satisfaction would even feel like. And so we're in a constant state of longing and consumption and demand and longing. And, um, and it's like, wait, hold on. Do I know what enough is? Do I know what I really want? How do I stop settling for, you know, I keep sort of jokingly saying, but it's true, the fake orgasm version of climate policy or the false solutions that we get sold, that these are supposed to satisfy at some surface level, what we've been asking for. We don't need those surface level false solutions. What we need is something that's deep down primal that is actually meeting all of the needs. So are we collectively satisfiable? How do we know when we're actually getting what we need and what we want? Um, how do we learn to love it? Love it when we hear people say no, celebrating the fact that there's a yes behind that and within that, that will get met and nourished. Um, earlier today, I got the, the honor of speaking with um, this faculty of color group uh, at ASU. And one of the things that came up in that conversation that I wanna repeat here is, I often have the feeling when I'm setting a boundary with someone, and it's still hard for me to set boundaries with people. I always wanna show up and be there, uh, but then sometimes I'm like, oh, this is, this is not safe, or I don't have the capacity or whatever it is. And I often wanna say to people, if you listened to my no, and if you honored my no, you'd actually benefit from my yes. Because each of us, when we are living inside of our yes and producing from our yes and generating life and ideas from our yes, we actually produce things that are more likely to be what our community needs than if we are doing work out of obligation, overextension, exhaustion, uh, work from a place that doesn't value ourselves. Okay. So, um, one of the questions I have here is what would the human experience look and feel like if more of us, especially more of us who have known, been rooted in an ancestral lineage of trauma, if more of us were able to live from an orgasmic, yes, a fully awakened yes. So this also has lineage. Um, one of the main pieces of lineage here is the work of Audre Lorde in the essay, The Uses of the Erotic as Power, which is included in the pleasure activism book, The Politics of Feeling Good. Another part of our lineage is Tony Cade Bambara. And there's an entire um, beautiful, beautiful piece from Alexis Pauline Gums in the book called The Sweetness of Salt that looks at five people who are living um, embodiments or were living embodiments during Alexis's time of what it looks like to, to bring Tony Cade Bambara into their lives every day. Um, and that book is one of the ones that was both written and gathered. So there's a ton of people in that book who are also part of the inspiration for those ideas. So that's three. The fourth big idea is transformative justice. And as a practice, to me, I see transformative justice as a practice of the abolition of punishment and the abolition of policing. And we look at it in the prison system currently. So we're trying to abolish the prison industrial complex. Um, but we also have to look at it in terms of how we are with each other. 
what would it look like to abolish the punishment culture that we hold with each other? And I, I think it's so important because when we really step back and look at the longer arc of history, we are still in the work of abolishing slavery. We are not completed with that. Um, if you look at how the prison industrial complex works, it's a modern day slavery system. We put people in there for all manner of things that we deem at any given moment harmful. A great example of this is there are a ton of people who are behind bars providing all kinds of labor um, to the places where they are who were put behind bars because of uh, charges related to marijuana, which is now legalized in many of the states where they are serving time and which um, white men, a lot of white men and white women and white people are making huge amounts of money legally selling this product that people still needed that medicine when, when folks who were going into prisons for that um, were buying it, selling it. So that's one example, right? Where we see like, well, who benefits from locking all these people up when it's mostly black people, brown people moving this product? Uh, so we haven't really let go of the practice of slavery or the practice of having some people who labor for little to no resources so that others of us can um, have our needs met in some way. And I think part of the reason we haven't been able to do that is because we haven't figured out what are these other practices and how do we do them? One of the things that Grace Lee Boggs taught me, taught us is that we have to transform ourselves to transform the world. That it's not enough to just be looking outward at how other people need to change, especially because we're talking about these meta systems of thinking and uh, systems of structure of our society. So we have to be able to look within where have these systems taken root inside of us and where do we need to relinquish our complicity in those systems, our comfort from those systems? Where do we need to be able to change? And when I'm looking at how do we practice transformative justice, I really am paying attention to how do we stop punishing and policing people in spaces where what we actually want is accountability and we actually want boundaries and we actually wanna feel safe and we actually wanna feel dignified. So I'm always saying for myself, how do I check the part of myself that wants to attack? How do I check the part of myself that wants to punish? How do I check the part of myself that wants to destroy anything that's different from me, anything I don't agree with? Um, and then how do I contribute to accountable connections and clear uh, respected boundaries. So the lineage of this work uh, is goes all the way back, I think, to anyone who's ever fought for abolition. You know, Harriet Tubman. We're, we're talking about like a long way, but then in this time, we are living in an abundant time of abolition freedom fighting workers. So we have Ruthie Wilson Gilmore, we have Miriam Kaba, we have Rachel Hertzig, we have Shira Hassan, um, we have Ijeris Dixon, we have Leah Lakshmi Piapsna Samra Sinha. Um, there's so many people who are active in this work. Andrea Ritchie writing about this work, Patrice Cullors thinking about this work, practicing this stuff. And we've never lived in a time where we've had as many resources published and available for us to look at around this stuff. And my offer, my small offer is the We Will Not Cancel Us booklet, which is really looking at like inside of movements, what are we doing? How are we holding each other accountable and how are we practicing abolition with each other? So I think all of these ideas, all these pieces come together under a larger concept for me of belonging. And more and more, I've been thinking of myself as a scholar of belonging, um, which is an idea that emerged last year my friend Prentice Hemphill and I were going back and forth, just sending each other ideas and thoughts. And we, we were checking in, you know, recently I'm like, did you say scholar of belonging? Did I say scholar? Like, we don't really know, <laughs> but it's like, it emerged from the conversation. Uh, my best thinking often emerges from conversation with Prentice Hemphill and, and others. So, uh, so this idea of like, what does it mean to be a scholar of belonging, which is something I think we all want so much. How do we belong to this place? How do we belong to this planet? How do we belong to this species? How do we belong to family? Um, how do we belong to love? How do we belong to friendship? How do we belong in our own bodies? You know, reclaiming that belonging of the body. How do we belong to community? And I think especially for those of us with a lineage of displacement, well, especially forced displacement, economic displacement from the lands that we were indigenous to, 
we keep seeking belonging everywhere we go. And in somatics and embodiment work, um, we learn that the most basic human needs are safety, dignity, and belonging. Um, and that we continue fighting and struggling to establish those things wherever we go. So I see us humans trying that in all these different ways. Um, some of us try it in religious spaces. I remember being younger and feeling belonging in church spaces, particularly church choir spaces, um, being in a choir of voices all singing at the same time. I just, you know, singing about something divine and, and larger than ourselves. I just knew that I belonged. And, and then I felt the heartbreak when um, aspects of my queer identity, aspects of my radical identity um, were like, oh, that, that's at odds. That, that doesn't fit in this space. Um, many of us, you know, find it in shared fandom, <laughs> you know, we're like, well, we all love this artist, we all love this book, we all love this movie or something. Um, and, but loving those external things doesn't actually produce that belonging in us. It may produce joy. I have a lot of joy every time I think about the existence of Beyonce, Giselle Knowles Carter, but I don't belong to her. She doesn't belong to me and I don't belong to the other people who love her. Um, so I keep thinking about this, who do we belong to? And one of the things I definitely see us doing is showing up in movement, expecting um, belonging, expecting to feel belonging, expecting belonging to be delivered to us. And I think we need to figure this out because I do think that movements, all kinds of movements need to be spaces that get good at belonging, cultivating belonging, because we wanna be an invitation and we want to be a sanctuary. I think that movements for social justice, movements for liberation, movements for environmental justice and climate change and all these things that were, were um, or climate justice for just transition, right? Movements that put us in right relationship to our future, they need to be a space that can actually hold and grow that future, which means we have to belong there. <laughs> so, this is where I start to move into the new ideas. So this thought occurred to me last night while I'm rereading the book All About Love by Bell Hooks with my fiance, which as an aside, I highly recommend getting in a practice of liberated relationship where you co-create commitment with someone and you get engaged. So I just got engaged. Um, and this is my first distinguished lecture as an engaged person. So highly recommend it. It's great. So, but we're reading All About Love Bell Hooks, and we're on chapter eight, which is about community. And as we're reading her, Bell Hooks' exploration of why we don't really know how to do community, I had these two aha moments. The first one was we really need to give Bell Hooks so many more flowers and awards and recognitions and donations and just everything. Like, it astounds me that we live at the same time as Bell Hooks. <laughs> and like, are we not, are we giving her enough for what she has given us? Uh, because she's been so generous as a thinker and a scholar and a writer. But the second aha was that right now, I think people are really ide uh, confusing identity with community and not finding satisfaction in either place. And I want to share some thoughts about this. So, you know, when I think about this, I'm like, what is identity, right? Uh, identity is often initially externally defined, a label for distinction, uh, a construct developed for supremacy or oppression to function, a practice of compartmentalizing a whole and complex miraculous being into one aspect of themselves that can be marked off with a checkbox. Identity is often quite binary, asking us to answer yes or no about aspects of ourself which are often much more complex, dynamic and spectrum oriented than that. Um, lately, I've actually been thinking that anything that's a binary that is being applied to humans is conservative, like good, bad, right, wrong, boy, girl. And in that, I mean, conservative, like trying to control and constrict nature and restrict change, um, conserve things as they are, deny complexity, make rigid what is actually fluid. So one of the things I think about identity is we have to survive and reclaim ourselves from most identities. And because we are a resilient species on a resilient earth, um, and we're all programmed to be adapting constantly, many of us have ended up finding ways to experience joy and power within these identities that someone else defined and put on us. And we've learned how to claim them 
as suits of armor within which we fight for our freedom. And some of us feel at least briefly a sense of belonging within specific identities, like being black. <laughs> for many of us, being black means having unspeakable trauma at our backs and having been wrenched from our ancestral and tribal homelands, our languages, our songs, the earth that we knew, um, surviving 10, 12 generations of torture and misery, violence, assault, child loss, um, dehumanization. And then somewhere inside of that, we claimed each other. We claimed each other across history, across different languages, across the cultural distinctions. We claimed each other, but that doesn't mean it's ever been an unconditional love situation, <laughs> right? We've claimed each other while all the time being like, who's black, what's black, are you black? How are you doing black? What is black men doing? What are black women doing? Is black queer okay, black this, black that? And there's all this, right? The multitudinous nature of us, our true nature keeps battling up against the edges of this container. And we are not the only peoples who have been forced into a collapsed identity um, that shares the experience of trauma and external reduction, but doesn't necessarily have enough room inside of it for the fullness of, of all that we are. So at minimum, identity is this crucial space from which we can organize across shared experience. But identity doesn't equal or promise community. So then what is community? So community is a, a place of practice and participation in care, in giving attention to each other, in knowing and being known, uh, being protected, having room to feel like we can fail, make mistakes, and that when we fail, we're not just still allowed to be around, but we're actually still seen as valuable in some way. Our, our lives matter to that community, to that place. So sometimes we're even given room to heal, to recover, um, because community feels responsible for each other. Right? Community feels responsible. Community is a choice. Um, more precisely, it's an accumulation of choices that we're making every day. And there's a set of growing practices. So being in my community, um, I often will make extra food <laughs> and give it to neighbors. Being in community means being aware of the amount of noise that I'm making in a space. Being community means that throughout this pandemic, I have been redistributing funds constantly, asking, receiving, asking, receiving, because everyone had all these different work scenarios when the pandemic hit and we still need to get through it. So community got each other through it. And I wanna uplift the work of Dean Spade, uh, this new book, Mutual Aid, which really looks at what mutual aid has looked like through this pandemic. But we have community or we can have community that is drawn together based on shared identity, obviously. So for me, Black organizing for leadership and dignity is a space like that, we call it bold. And it works because it allows a wide ranging space for us to be in our own black experiences and to come together without having to negate each other's black experiences. Um, we center around naming and healing our trauma together. There's an assumption like we have this trauma and it needs healing. Um, we're also actively working to change material conditions through organizing. We are building a shared political analysis together through political study and scholarship. And then we delight in the pleasure of being together, right? So all of these components are part of what makes it a community, not just we're Black showing up together. There's more to what actually makes it a community inside of that. I think we all long for community. And I think we expect and sometimes demand it from those with whom we share identity, but then no one is teaching us to community. So we don't always know how to do it. And Bell Hooks examines this at the realm of family. Um, she points out that there's so many assumptions we make about what family will allow us to do, teach us to do. And so few families actually work that way. <laughs> so most of us come to the end of our time ex exclusively with family, like, I don't really know how to community yet. And then we go to schools and if we're lucky, we have teachers who find ways to help us learn how to be in community with each other. But to put a fine point on it, we're being trained to be capitalist. <laughs> you know, We're being trained to compete with each other in a system of scarcity, to be better than each other, um, to be better than each other at 
the same standardized tests. Like we all need to have the same skills and the same knowledge. We have to regurgitate back what we're given 12 years of uh, that training and regurgitation. And so whether we learn community in that space or not, we're getting socialized to be around each other, but not necessarily to be with, to take responsibility, to hold each other. That depends on if you get lucky and you get a teacher who figures out a way to fit that in around the standardized testing, right? So then there's, uh, oh, and the thing I wanna mention about this is Octavia Butler talked about this, our fatal human flaw is that we have intelligence paired with hierarchy that we have all this capacity to think and reason, but we primarily use it just to one-up each other, just to create systems of dominance and superiority. And I'm always asking myself, like, how would we heal from that? How would we heal from that? And especially if, if what we're all being socialized and learning in our schooling systems is that competitive hierarchical nature. So then we have the internet, <laughs> which is like a very confusing space when it comes to these questions of, identity and community because ostensibly we're generating belonging there. You know, we're, we're forming groups, we have followers, we have hashtags, we have things that we all collectively care about. And I think we can practice community there, but it's also really confusing because I think we can get super mixed up by what we mean by community, um, how we understand and how we navigate identity and how we answer the need for belonging amongst strangers, even if sometimes it starts to feel like we're very intimate strangers. So the internet is not necessarily the place that we can go to to meet that need of belonging. And people realize that if they say the wrong thing on the internet, <laughs> all of a sudden it's like, we loved you yesterday, today you're trash to us, right? The internet is very fickle. And so then we have a culture, right? The internet is not just outside of our culture. We shaped it and it's shaping us back. Okay, so now we're living inside of a, a world, inside of generations. We're going to be shaped by this internet cultural space when it comes to belonging. And then we have our organizations, our institutions, which many of us try to recreate family dynamics inside of, right? Red flag. So if our families didn't know how to generate belonging and community, we're not going to learn that inside of our organizations. And so we don't learn how to practice conflict in a generative way, be honest with each other, um, set good boundaries, all those kind of things. And then we come to our formations, our political formations, our movement formations. We're trying to generate belonging through shared analysis, through organizing together, but we often end up trying to one-up each other for often unnamed social power. Um, and we end up also gossiping about each other, also pointing out each other's imperfections and shortcomings and misalignments, and also struggling because to survive, our formations get pitched against each other for what we are told by limited resources. So philanthropy, which often is undergirding this sort of nonprofit formational space, has not really supported belonging <laughs> at all. So the more I look at movements and the more I look at society right now, I see that we want belonging and we are trained to use almost every breath to not belong to each other. And so then we land in these spaces of identity, which are massive, black, immigrant, queer, disabled, woman, you know, spaces which are too broad and divergent to actually be able to offer and sustain belonging for the individuals within. And then it gets painful. I think that that longing for belonging can grow toxic, it, you know, can be like, no one sees me, someone is gonna see me, even if I have to throw a tantrum or cause harm to get this attention. And I think we see people end up in these loops, you know, uh, my identity is under attack or my identity is being ignored or my identity is being co-opted um, or my identity has it worse than any other identity. And then, then sometimes, you know, any manner of things happen, right? Sometimes there's no response at all. Sometimes people show up in this kind of vague, righteous solidarity. Um, sometimes we change how we speak about that identity, but not how we actually practice being with each other. We don't change our behaviors or our beliefs. So right now, they're in that sort of external realm, there's a rash of crimes and hateful acts against people who share an identity, you know, Asian, trans, black, immigrant, queer, sex worker. Um, that, that rash of hateful targeted action has been fairly consistent. And now we know about it every time it happens because we're more connected by the internet, right? 
So it feels ubiquitous that all these identities are being attacked and we're trying to like stick our fingers in the dam of solidarity. Um, but then when we most need each other, even within movement spaces, our internal attacks on each other, our intolerance with each other's failures is also on the rise. Our fragility in the realm of connection is so high right now when our need for interdependence and being aligned with something larger than ourselves is desperate. So on every level, I think the answer is community, but we have to get in that practice. And I mean here both community for those who are under attack, right? We have to get in and deepen how are we in community with each other? How do we combat regressive, conservative, narrow thinking, uh, racism and white supremacy and those stereotypes? I think that happens at the level of community when we're in relationship and we know each other well enough to say, that's not okay. Here's what we need to do to grow your analysis, your heart, your compassion, so that you can actually participate in community because this community includes all of those identities, right? Um, I think accountability happens at the level of community. But we also have to know that community is the answer for traumatized people and lost people, people who are actively causing harm. It's easier to say, no, <laughs> that flawed, disruptive, messy person does not belong to me. That damaged person does not belong to us. Um, and I think that's how we end up complicit in the current prison system is someone somewhere has to take accountability, has to take responsibility, has to feel like I can get in community um, with this person in their spiritual growth. I wanna uplift, I recently got to see this film since I've been down and it's gonna be coming out. We're gonna be doing events around it because I was so blown away by seeing how these prisoners are building a community for each other's transformation in Washington state. And I, I want everyone to see this, but it made me think, they, they're onto this thing, they understand this thing. They belong to each other and they belong outside of whatever narratives they've been told that would keep them apart from each other. And they belong to each other just to be curious about the roots of each other's harm, right? What dissatisfaction, what heartache, what harm, what violence, what longing, what trauma is at the root of the harm that you have turned and caused? Community also has to hold that. And those are often very distinct communities. Right? The communities that can hold the survivor can't always be the community that's holding the person who's caused harm. So as we heal, as we regain our humanity from these legacies of trauma, I think what we all need is community. And the things that have currently split us from each other, um, it has us like an open wound. So we have to remove what is toxic at the level of belief, at the level of behavior. And then we have to imagine these open wounds being able to close, being able to form scars, right? I want, I, I don't think that we'll ever be like, oh, capitalism didn't exist. It'll be a scar. Capitalism is a scar on our humanity. White supremacy is a scar on our humanity. It's a marking of something that we went through and we survived and it was extremely painful, but we learned from and we healed from. We have to imagine that that's possible. And there's a huge community organizing and developing these ideas. I mentioned a lot of them. Um, I want to uplift the Embodiment Institute, the Prentice Hemphill is getting off the ground. I want to uplift Just Practice, which Shira Hassan and Miriam Kaba run that's helping people learn how to do these accountability practices. I want to uplift Vision Change Win, which Ajiris Dixon runs. Um, Bold, which I talked about. The Movement for Black Lives is really thinking about how do we operate at the level of relationship and strategy and change. Um, I want to uplift the body is not an apology, right? really looking at how do we heal from the inside out. So those are all the core ideas. These are all the fresh thoughts. And now I'm really excited to be in conversation uh, with Mako and with all of you about these things and more things. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you so much for your work, for your words and everything that you do to sustain this work in the beloved community. I think that your work is more than accessible, right? That it is required reading for anyone who is doing diversity, equity, inclusion, justice work, especially in institutional spaces, right? Thank you. Um, and your work is rooted in a profound, uh, what we talked about earlier as a socio-spiritual understanding of human 
connection. So I want to ask all of those in the space, both here on Zoom and on YouTube, to post questions, comments, words of affirmation for Adrian in the Q&A box and the comment box. Um, and throughout our interaction, I will be referencing and engaging Adrian's written work, okay. um, both as an act of critical reflection, but I think more importantly to model a citation politic. That's yeah. in the words of uh, feminist theorist Chandra Mohanty, she warns, that's not extractive or transactional, but intentional, respectful and transformational. Yes. So one of our first questions comes from YouTube and that is because the concept of justice has been linked to embodied criminality, do you think there is or are better terms to reflect the spirit of justice or would a reclaiming of justice be more fruitful? Yes, I mean, I think this is a dance with language all the time is there's so many ways that we're in battles over words, over language. And when we have been socialized around it being one way, we're like, oh, justice means, the justice department means these things, um, which I think is exactly why some people have pointed and put our finger and said, actually, we want justice and we're gonna, we're gonna claim it, but put transformative in front of it, put restorative in front of it. So that we articulate something that has a much longer lineage than its current usage. And I have this battle with all kinds of things. Like, you know, uh, I think, and we will not cancel as I talk about um, wanting to reclaim the language of pro-life, right? Um, I think, because I'm like, you cannot be pro-life if you're trying to kill everybody all the time <laughs> and you're trying to deny yes. all the different ways that we are alive. It's just ludicrous to me, right? And so there's, there's all these language articulations. One thing I'll uplift in relationship to this is Miriam Kaba and Shir Hassan really, they stick much more with the language of community accountability. And there's a whole lineage thread that has focused more on the language of community accountability instead of transformative justice. And there's history and all of those things. And I love that language of accountability. I like the language of accountability culture, right? Um, especially in, you know, now we're using the language of culture for so many things. So, you know, it's cancel culture, it's call out culture, it's this culture, it's that culture. It's like, what would it look like to live inside of a culture of accountability um, to be immersed in that? Right. And, you know, for me, I find transformative justice very satisfying to think about a justice that actually goes to the root and says what needs to be transformed here. Mm -hmm. And I want to be in a direct battle with those who are engaged in punitive justice. I want mm -hmm. to say justice and for people to hear what I'm speaking about and be like, oh, you know, especially people are like, I want abolition or I, I've said defund the police. And I'm like, but are you still punishing people in your own life? Mm -hmm. You know, are you still punishing people online? Are you still punishing family members? Like, where is that still, uh, where's policing still inside of you, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I think right now, at least it's still a worthwhile battle. Right, mm -hmm. how we engage in acts of policing in our everyday interactions with our children, with our friends and loved ones, with our colleagues, yes. especially in institutions that are oh, yes. designed to sustain hierarchies of privilege and power. Oh, yes. Right. Oh, yes. Right. I mean, you know, it's, it's um, again, you know, for me, I look at slave era as like setting all these patterns for, for Black people. So it's like part of how we were controlled against each other was that some of us were the police of each other within our own ranks that still exists. And yes. I just watched Judas and the Black Messiah, yes. which is mm -hmm. the incredible, incredible film about the life of Fred Hampton, um, or more about the death of Fred Hampton and about the infiltrator who murdered him. And I think about this all the time where I'm like, that tendency of policing um, to me is, is like an idea that has infiltrated our systems and turns us against each other. And mm -hmm. so it makes use of people who don't even have to be paid as infiltrators because they're right. so actively engaged in the, in the practice. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, we need to be very conscious about the concept of it and the practices of it and how comfortable they feel to us currently. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So thinking about 
the fractal nature, what you write about in immersion strategy. We have a yes. question from Zoom participant Rua Williams, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, but but they ask, thinking of the fractal nature you talk about in immersion strategy and here tonight, it seems so many of us need to heal our mm-hmm. own traumas and forge better patterns of relation to transform our movements. How can we help each other with this in ways that are not dependent upon existing structures of mental health that can perpetuate discipline, institutionalization, and incarceration? How do we learn to be trauma doulas? Ah, beautiful. Um, Well, I mean, I think, you know, the questions like this, I'm always like, part of the answer is in the question. I was like, we need to learn to be trauma doulas, right? Mm -hmm. We need to learn to sit and actually really be present with the fact that we all have trauma that needs to move through our systems and move through our bodies. So three things come to mind um, and I'll see if I can track them all. The first is um, I think each of us benefits from doing some version of that somatic healing, whether you get a somatic therapist or you're in a group that is doing some kind of somatic release, but it moving things out from the body, right? Because so often we're coming together and we're trying to argue each other mind to mind, idea to idea without acknowledging that our bodies are carrying so much trauma into the space and we're interacting with each other as embodied trauma responses rather than um, shared ideological comrades. So that's the first piece. Um, The second is I think of my friend Malkia Devich Cyril who wrote the afterword for We Will Not Cancel Us. And Malkia continuously creates community and I, got to, I get to watch them create community that it just astounds me, the kind of intimacy mm-hmm. that they create. But it's because they're building community around their trauma and around their grief. So their wife um, was taken by cancer a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, their wife, uh, Alana devich Cyril, there's an interview with her in Pleasure Activist, incredible person. Mm-hmm. So Malkia's response to that was to invite community in. Whereas a lot of, where a lot of people are, you know, are like, oh, this trauma is happening. I'm going to disappear from sight and just be present in it. But Malkia opened the door of her heart, of her life, of the experience. And we walk through the grief with her. And then she has invited a community to be with her in multiple ways. Um, every month we do a cleanse that's about getting in right relationship with our bodies and how do we listen to what our bodies need. There's a weekly um, community where we get together to practice joy in the face of grief, right? And it's incredible. So I think of those practices. And it's like, we actually we actually do know how to do this, but I think sometimes we're scared to do it at the level of relationship. And mm-hmm. we're like, oh, we need to build this massive thing. No, Malkia started with like, I'm inviting 15 people who I trust to walk through my grief with me to be in community with me. And let's see what happens from there. And that brings me to the third thing, which is, Part of what we did in 2019 with the Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute was basically experiment with answering this question in real time. And we brought community together, usually about 75 to 80 people in a community to practice emergent strategy together. What happened in every single room was the community got to name what needs our attention, what needs some healing, what needs us to, to really look at it. And then almost every time the community developed rituals for how to be with that thing. And I'm like, oh, we know what we need to do, but we're not giving ourselves any room. We're trying to do panel after panel after panel to talk about things. And in these spaces, people would get together and create art projects for us to do or teach us songs um, or hold healing circles after which we went and broke things. Mm. Um, We did a rage circle, a rage practice with each other where we all just got to be fucking piss. <laughs> you know, it was just like such incredible rituals. And it made me, I was just like, oh, like I need to keep learning about ritual and I need to learn about emergent ritual. And I think we right. all need to learn about emergent ritual because there's something that allows us to bring together lots and lots and lots of different lineages into shared mm-hmm. rituals that, that feel new, but are actually rooted yes. for each of us in different soil. Yes. So we have a question from Zoom um, okay. that I think I think about this in the context of where we are situated virtually in a higher yes. education space. Yes. 
Yes. And there are many folk, folks on the call, folks in the university who are engaged in community. Yeah. In different levels, in different ways, whether it's through research, through activism, through their own sort of lived everyday experience, right? As members of communities. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the first, the, the affirmation, thank you for your wonderful talk and for all of your work. Since you're speaking at a university, I'm wondering if you can talk about where you see education and education systems and institutions fitting into this work. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. You know, I feel like um, one of the things that excites me, and I think Octavia Butler taught me, that you never know who you're going to be in the apocalypse with. And so you have to approach every single person you interact with as a potential comrade, as someone who could be capable of hearing your vision and sharing it. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about this earlier, um, that's like people enter the institution and the institution is so big and so structured that it can feel really scary to try to maintain yourself inside of that and maintain your analysis of what needs to be changed inside of that. Um, and that for some people, they're like, oh, I'll change it once I get tenure, once I get all the way through the mm -hmm. door. Um, but then on the way, you lose so much of yourself that by the time you get there, there's, there's you don't have that fight. You don't have that right. even capacity to see it. That's so right. I think one of the pieces of work right now is for those of, us, those of us who are educators inside the academy or outside the academy to recognize that our job is to foment the revolutionary in our students in mm -hmm. the people who, who are coming up. And by foment the revolutionary, what I mean is foment that part um, that can feel like there is a cycle of change, there is a cycle of transformation. And my job is to be pushing and moving and generating mm -hmm. that cycle. Um, students, young people are the ones who create the changes often in these universities, right? They're the ones who are like, we need a policy around sexual assault. We need a policy around how investments happen. We need a policy around um, this practice of endowment hoarding. We need policies around these things that, that change, uh, you know, change culture. So I think that's one piece of it. I think the other part is for the period of time that, that people are in the university setting, it is a community, right? It's like you're in the same ge geographical space you are sharing the same environment. You're in the same external conditions of your city or your town, your place. And I think practicing community in those spaces is so important. When I look back at my college experience, um, what strikes me is I learned as much about movement and organizing and everything that I've gone on to do in what I was doing outside of the classroom as I did trying to navigate what was happening inside of the classroom. And I had some great teachers. So I had teachers who really fomented the revolutionary in me, the free thinker, the critical thinker in me. But I was also really moved by how I built community. I learned to be an abolitionist in that space. I developed an analysis of police violence in that space. Um, I learned about HIV AIDS and I learned about sexual assault and that, there, that you could build community around this thing that for most of us happens. And then we're like, I have to hide. You know, yes. there's so many parts of myself that I was like, this is a cauldron in which I can mm -hmm. practice what it's like to bring my whole self in and demand to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I would say not to take it so seriously that you, you relinquish yourself. This should be a space where you're claiming yourself, claim, claim, yes. claim yourself. Don't waste your time on things that are not interesting to you. That's right. <laughs> Don't waste That's your time right. on things that are not interesting to you. Yes. Or yeah. the orgasmic yes. Yes, right. As you talk about guess, in pleasure activism, this is my thing, right? I'm like yes. start as early and often as you can. Um, also, pay as as much or more attention to the relationships you're forming as you do to anything that you're like learning or studying. Um, my closest friends still to this day are people that I was in in college with and in the, in the institution with. Um, and even though I have all kinds of thoughts about the institution itself. Um, it brought together some people who are really of like mind and like spirit, kindred, mm -hmm. kindred people that I'm grateful to claim every day. Yes. Mm -hmm. So our next question comes from the Queer Doula Network. And mm -hmm. this is a question that is, I think, intimately connected to your book, We Will Not 
cancel us. And okay. if you haven't had a chance to pick this book up, everyone should, because it is a primer, it is a pocket book that we hold and we consistently refer back to. So the question is this, well, one, love this conversation and your work, Adrian. Just wondering how we avoid releasing oppressive forces from accountability, which is typical when we focus too intensely on the harm of cancel culture. So privileged folks in general are not actually 100% canceled and it's almost a misnomer oh, and yeah. not on accountability. Yes. Yeah, I mean, this has been, it's been so interesting to release this book <laughs> and, and like the conversations that it has led to, um, you know, one of the things I think is so fascinating about call outs and cancellation in general is, you know, there's a place for it, but it's usually with people who are so privileged that there's no other way to get their attention or to call them That's into right. accountability um, because privilege allows them to continuously skirt accountability. And what I was talking about, what I'm talking about in that book is this idea of um, we're using the strategy on people who don't actually have that level of privilege or that level of platform. And what it ends up doing is creating just a sort of destructive pattern inside of our communities, which I don't think is accountable. And yes. I do think it really distracts us. It makes us feel like we're more divided than we are. It makes it feel like we're more stratified than we are. Um, and I think it requires a certain humility to recognize that we're all much closer um, to the same place inside of the power dynamics than we want to acknowledge or, or um, honor. Right. I do think, and, and what I write about in the book is to me, abolition is an invitation to be accountable to and with each other and to feel responsible for each other. And, and to acknowledge like, we need things that actually work. <laughs> we need things that actually work. So I always say this, I'm like, if canceling people worked, I might be gung-ho, right? Like if I was like, oh, that stopped the harm. Yay, yes, right? But it doesn't. And one of the, the metaphors um, I use in the book is the, the metaphor of mycelium and mushrooms. Mm. That mycelium are so... Um, abundant underground. And so when you see one little mushroom um, and you pluck that mushroom and you eat that mushroom or that mushroom is poisonous or it's toxic or whatever it is, you haven't done anything to that mm. massive system underground. So if that system, you know, if we think of harm is that um, like sexual harm, I think is a really beautiful and powerful example of this is sexual harm is everywhere in our right. society. We are constantly being trained into it, we're being trained to participate in it from a very young age. The way gender plays out supports it. The way race yes. and class play out support it. Um, sex is one of the spoils uh, when people are practicing power over. Um, we see what just happened with the sex workers in Atlanta. Like the, it, it is, it is um, every part of our society. I think is steeped in this harmful behavioral stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. And so then when we say, oh, this person in our community, we're going to call just this one person out for this, and we're going to try to disappear them. Mm -hmm. What I think happens, instead of what we want to happen, like what we want to have is be like, we call them out, we stop this harm, yes. But what actually happens, I think, is instead of being able to invite that person into, here's a process that will actually hold accountability, and mm -hmm. then we get to see what transformation looks like. What does it look like for someone to relinquish patterns of that kind of harm? What is it, what, how long does it actually take for someone to be in processes where they're actually able to look at their behavior and be like, oh, mm -hmm. how did I get here? How did I get to a place where I was um, causing this kind of harm, scaring people right. in this way? Like, how did all this happen? Right. And that process takes a lot longer. I think that mm -hmm. process is more like a five to 10 year process, yes. but we're trying to do things in a one month to one year process. And mm -hmm. so it's like the timelines don't line up. And so then we don't get these satisfying results. And the thing I will offer to this, because I think we're going to be here for a while. Like, I think we're going to be in this place where it's like, we're doing the call outs to try to stop immediate harm, to staunch the wound that is bleeding right now, while we try to also simultaneously attend to this longer process of stopping harm patterns. And I think we have to kind of be able to do both things at the same time, like yes. recognize and start to have discernment around what is the right 
move or strategy in this moment. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think we have community is always the answer. Mm -hmm. So I really think we have to be able to form communities that are comfortable holding those who have done harm and Mm -hmm. form communities that are comfortable and able to meet the needs of the survivor. Um, I think right now we don't have that. We have people who are trying really hard and trying to do both. I think the thing that's hard is we are early in our practice. And the metaphor I use for this is often when a baby is learning to walk. So the baby stands up and wobbles and then falls right, plops right back down. And then probably at some point, and we've all seen this, uh, if you've been around a baby, the baby face plants. And it's like really scary. Like, did you really just hurt yourself or did you knock your whole nose off? Or the baby hits their head on the edge of a coffee table or something else. Mm-hmm. All of this is the part, the process of learning to walk. Yeah. It hurts, it's dangerous. Um, and then they just keep trying over and over. And eventually they're like, oh, I can't do it by myself. I got to hold on to something, mm-hmm. pull myself up. It takes at least 3000 reps to begin to have the muscle memory to stand yeah. much less walk. So right now we're in a place of crisis where we want to be running, yes. but we're still learning how to stand. Right. And if we can see, our, if we can like step back and see that, then it's like, oh, mm-hmm. this is hard and I have to stay in and I have to invite more people in. And I think right. that's the danger that we're in right now mm-hmm. is that the way we're treating each other is not making more people want to step in and help take on this work. That's right. right? And we need more people to step in and take in this work. So, you know, we're offering mediation trainings. Um, Just Practice is offering trainings on how to do community accountability processes. Mm -hmm. Shira and Miriam put out this book, Fumbling Towards Repair, which is like a workbook Mm. on how how do we hold these things. Because one of the things that that Miriam and Shira have talked about is it's not going to be a one-to-one transition from Mm -hmm. punitive justice to like some massive, highly functional transformative justice process. It's going to be relinquishing that system and redistributing those resources into a ton of different community experiments, Mm -hmm. which means all of us have to learn to hold parts of this. And there's so much we can learn from those those toolkits, especially in higher education, right? You sort of opened up with the sort of I'm distinguished, darling. This is this kind of distinguished, darling. Right. (laughs) And I think that 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 speaks to the perception that many in the academy or the professoriate like to think of ourselves as being so distinguished. We are above the toolkits. Distinguished, darling. Right. Yes. But to to be (laughs) honest, we all need toolkits. We all need toolkits. I mean, I would love to see us engage some of these toolkits in building right relationships with each other as colleagues, so that we show up to faculty meetings with care, so that we show up for each other That's with right. a deep and profound sense of care as opposed to a kind of competition. That's right, because you have to break that resources. cycle of competition, right? right? That's right, and it starts that. with each other. It does. And I think sometimes people don't realize that breaking the competition doesn't start with who gets the grant and right. who gets the position. It actually starts with a good morning, dear yes. colleague. How are you? Yeah. How is life? How is your family? How are your children? Yeah. And the blame and shame game that you talk about so eloquently, right? That that, is, that has to end. And yeah. one of the places that it begins to end is with ourselves. And when we begin to build those right relationships. And earlier today, you said that the reading of Octavia Butler has really taught you that storytelling is the most ancient collective practice that we have. And storytelling, it's that oral tradition. It's that beginning to share of each other, our stories with each other. And we know that the study of humanities is built upon how we tell the multiple and diverse stories about our planet and our past. So we have a question from Maj, um, who says, I'm inspired by the way you speak about science fiction and Octavia Butler's work. And I would like to ask you to speak more about the strategies or tools that you have found inside of fiction or the practice of ficting by bringing us closer to an erotic sensibility in our living and our more complex relationships to self and to community. I like this thick question. <laughs> it's like a lot in there. Um, you know, 
I want to sort of go back to when I first started reading Octavia and was reading science fiction and how pleasurable it was, you know, like when I would find myself, like it's time I get to read, I'm done with what I need to do. And like, now I get to like sit back and just like immerse myself in Octavia's work. And I have the blessing of a crap memory. So every time I read the book, I'm just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, like I can reread and reread and reread. And each time I'm kind of thrilled and titillated anew. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things I learned in there was Octavia and many other writers, Ursula Le Guin does this, Nadia Korafor does this, Tanata Review does this, mm -hmm. Samuel Delaney does this, looks at the world as it is. N.K. Jemisin does this big yes. time. So these are authors who are looking at the world and, and saying, I can imagine something really compelling from this. It's not dystopian even though it is set in a dystopian environment. But Octavia's parables are set in this dystopian environment, but what we're paying attention to is the person within that, the young person within that, she's 15 when we meet her, who has a destiny, something that is driving her to be in right relationship with the forces of her environment. It's super compelling, right? For someone, when I first read it, I was like, holy snap, like everything I've been told was someone else's story for what humanity was up to, but I could create my own story for what we're up That's to. Right. I could create a collaborative collective story for what we're up to. And so many, I think of these um, fiction writing, this, the endeavor of fiction writing mm -hmm. as giving us case studies from the future, right? Yes. Is really looking, you know, if this goes on, here's a case study. What if, here's a case study, right? Uh, science fiction is like, so if we take the scientific concept, one of the concepts in the parables is that people have taken this drug that's supposed to help offset the impacts of Alzheimer's and dementia. And they're taking the drug, they start taking it recreationally, and then it has this impact on the next generation. They're born mm -hmm. with this syndrome, hyper-empathy syndrome. So the science of it is something we deal with all the time, that we're constantly giving ourselves medication to address something, some isolated aspect of our health without necessarily thinking or knowing or having a way to know what are going to be the multi-generational long-term impacts of this. That's the science of it. Now it feels really relevant. I just got my first uh, shot of the vaccine mm. and, you know, they hand you the paper while you're doing it. It's like, this is untested, unverified, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> They're like, we just want to make sure, you know, basically, you know, we hope that this doesn't cause any harm, but we can't really promise anything. And you take it, you know, for me, I took it because what I'm trying to do in my present life in this moment is so compelling. I need this yes. to be able to have access to the world that I want to be living in. Right. But my mind can't help but imagine that scientific, oh, right? So of course, now I'm writing fiction about that, right? It's like, what are the potential pathways of what this vaccine does? And what I like to do is be like, you know, one of the ways storytelling is told, and I think I've talked about this, um, is it's usually built around a core conflict. Almost mm -hmm. all stories are built around a core conflict. And I'm trying to practice what, what does it look like if I build a story around a core pleasure or a core transformation, right? That there doesn't have to necessarily be a conflict, but there's still a tension that drives, mm -hmm. you know, the tension of orgasm. Like, I'm not in conflict when I'm having my orgasms. You know, I'm just like, there's right. a tension, there's a buildup, there's something that needs to be released. And what would it look like to build stories that way? And mm -hmm. so I'm like, what if this vaccine produces something that is an orgasmic evolutionary change for humans, mm -hmm. right? What if it unleashes something that we actually need unleashed and that that becomes the way that we harness um, mm -hmm. something that is, is worth the trauma and the, the terror and the sadness that we have just lived through, the grief mm -hmm. that we're in, you know? Yes. My mom sent me a picture today of, of my uncle who passed away from COVID. And, you know, I was just saying, I'm like, I, I'm like, how do we make it worth this grief? How, how can it ever possibly be worth what we have just lost? Um, to me, fiction is the way that I can begin to answer that question. Um, mm -hmm. That I'm like, I have to write and imagine stories mm -hmm. where the grief is harnessed into something that helps humans to grow, to learn, to yes. evolve, to be better. So on the erotic tip, the erotic sensual component of it, I think about Octavia's uh, Lilith's brood Yes. And there's this alien species that the Onkali, <laughs> yes. um, they have a third gender and they have mm -hmm. to mate with that gender. And if you had told me like this 
kind of insect-like species comes to earth and um, is post-apocalypse and like humans are fully reliant on them, I'll be like, hell no. But Octavia took that and she made it one of the most erotic mm -hmm. things I've ever read, like still to this day. Like when I think about the Uncali, like I'm kind of like, <laughs> and I'm like, that's <laughs> fascinating, right? Like it, it just, it creates a different possibility. Like when I see, you know, stories like, are there aliens? You know, is this an alien? I'm like, maybe they're hot. And that helps me prepare for a future. That helps me at least open up a possibility. And I think there's something around giving people the sense of the future. To me, really great science fiction is fiction where you walk away and you, you know, when I read the Broken Earth trilogy, mm -hmm. um, which is by uh, N.K. Jemison, mm -hmm. for days, for months, actually still, you know, all the time, I'm walking around looking at the earth differently and like what it would feel like to be moving through the earth because so much of it is people traveling through the center of the earth. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm and like what it felt like the pressure, the heat, the whole thing. And it's just like, it's a very sensational experience of uh, now I'm like, oh, that feels possible because I have imagined mm -hmm. it. That's you know? right. Because as you say, pleasure is a measure of freedom. Yes. And we have to begin to ask ourselves am I feeling a sense of pleasure? And exactly. if I am feeling that, how is that an indicator of my freedom? That's right. So I wanna ask if you have any final thoughts that you would like to share with our, mm. with the folks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this piece, you know, when we think about the academy, when we think about these institutions, when we think about our organizing, um, I feel like sometimes, you know, people show up and they're like, Adrian, can you tell us how to community? Can you tell us how to belong? Can you tell us how to find pleasure? Can you tell us these things? Mm -hmm. And what I want to encourage or like kind of push back or like send back to you is like, I think each of us has a piece of the puzzle inside of us. Mm -hmm. And it's the piece of the puzzle is the part of us that has the most distinct longing. Mm -hmm. You know, the part of us maybe that feels the loneliest, right. the part of us that's like, I don't feel seen and I don't feel heard. And I think if we start to articulate um, a future, write the story of a future in which you knew that you belonged mm -hmm. and that you were part of generating other people's belonging. Mm -hmm. And tell me everything about it, right? Tell your reader everything about it. Tell yourself everything about it. Mm -hmm. It's particular to you. You know something about belonging that no one else does. Yes. It's, it's your piece. I think that each of us need to be writing these stories and thinking about this, praying on this, being in, in ritual around this. Yes. Um, that I do so much mediation and so much support for people who, even in their most intimate spaces, are lying to themselves about belonging. And so they end up not even belonging to themselves. Mm -hmm. And then they're angry at the world for not feeling that belonging. And uh, and then we come into the institutions or we come into the, you know, the realm and it's like, why don't you make me feel like I belong, you know? Right. 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 And it's like, what, you know, write a story for ASU. What would it feel like if it was a sanctuary? What would it feel like if it was a place mm. for like you arrived and if you were a student, you knew that you belonged. How do you know that? If you're a teacher, you just knew that you belonged, right? Um, if you're a worker, if you're serving food to the students, you know that you belong. How? What makes it possible to, to sense that belonging? Mm -hmm. And from an internal, like, what do you have to practice? Because I don't think the belonging just happens to us. I think it's something like we extend, right? Like, I think about how every plant I own, I don't own any of these plants, how every plant that's in my home mm -hmm. belongs to the sun in some way, right? Yes. It doesn't just mm -hmm. sit there like sun they all reach for the sun. They all reach for the sun. They're reaching for their belonging to life. And yeah, I think that that's what we need to be practicing. It's like, what does it look like for each of us to turn and be like, belonging is the sun. How do we reach for it mm. in our own communities and from our own bodies? Mm. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I want to encourage everyone to listen and re-listen to the recording because so many gems were there. And I'm going to turn this back over to Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your incredibly moving and inspiring talk. talk. I'm so grateful to you, Adrian Marie Brown and Dr. Fitzward for creating this conversation that I know will continue to inspire our work in the humanities. 
and all our communities. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to those of you in the webinar and on YouTube for attending the 2021 IHR Distinguished Lecture. I'm Nicole Anderson, the IHR Director, and I hope you'll consider joining us for future events hosted by the IHR. These events include a panel discussion on insurgent geophysics and black gravities with Catherine Yusoff, Tina Kemp and JT Roan, as well as two workshops hosted by the National Centre for Faculty Development and Diversity. So keep an eye out for these events and others by subscribing to our newsletter or by going to our events page online at ihr.asu.edu forward slash events. If you want to share today's event with friends or colleagues, it will be saved on our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash IHRASU. Thank you again, and we hope to see you again soon.